everybody, this is Pastor Derek, and I want to welcome you to our time together in God's Word. Thank you for joining us. I don't know where you are or when you might be watching this. Hopefully you're joining us live during the live um, streaming of this, but if you're joining us later in the week, hey, if it's two or three years from 2020, I'm glad you're with us, and I'm glad we get to spend some time together in God's Word. I'm going to ask you to turn to John chapter 9. We're continuing our Go series where we're walking through uh, Matthew's Gospel in Matthew chapter 10. But this week, John chapter 9 is going to serve as an illustration for us of a a passage from Matthew chapter 10. Uh, Scripture is the best commentary on Scripture. So we want to see something lived out in uh, John chapter 9 that is communicated to us in Matthew chapter 10. And we're turning our hearts towards this idea of how do we communicate the gospel in a culture of honor and shame. So our culture is shifting right before our eyes from a culture that really focuses on right and wrong, guilt and innocence, to a culture that's more focused on honor and shame. So how do we communicate, how must we communicate the gospel in a culture like that. Well, as you're finding your way there to John chapter 9, I want to tell you that last week someone posted some pictures from uh, one of the people that I went to high school with, posted some pictures from high school, and I brought one of those pictures I I want to show you today. So uh, you can see that picture there, and and boy, what a great picture. I mean, I I hope you're as amazed by that picture as I am. Now, I know some of you are thinking, didn't you say high school because you look like you're about 10 years old there? Uh, It just reveals one of the the secrets that I hide behind this beard, that I have a baby face. I always have had a baby face. I believe in that picture I'm about 15 years old. Uh, But I want to point out the shirt I'm wearing because, man, that is a fantastic shirt. I mean, if you can't appreciate the the wonder and beauty of that shirt, then I I have to question your your sense of fashion. But here's the question I want to ask. Why was I wearing that shirt? Why did I choose that shirt for picture day? And make no mistake about it, I knew it was picture day. And I chose that shirt for picture day. Well, it's because the culture around me told me that that shirt, believe it or not, was really cool. I was very proud of that shirt. I wore that shirt quite often. It was a, it was a Western shirt. It was a shirt that I wore when, when I went out riding horses. And you know what? It was a shirt that a lot of people at my school either liked or they wore a shirt like that. Here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that the reason I picked that shirt really had much more to do with the culture around me and whether or not I would be accepted or rejected by the culture around me, then it had to do with really something about whether or not I personally like that shirt. Now, we've all been there, haven't we? We've all been to that place where we picked out what we wore, how we looked, how we dressed, how we talked, what we did, based off of the culture around us. In fact, I would, I would say that some of you have some pictures uh, from high school that uh, might even reveal some worse fashion choices maybe than the shirt that I'm wearing. Well, as we turn our attention to God's Word, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that even though we like to pretend that we have grown out of that, in many ways our culture is shifting back to a time where we are more focused on status and what people around us think than than we've ever seen before in, in American history. So I want us to think about this today. In fact, this is the message that I want us to walk away with. To reach a culture obsessed with status, we must overpower shame. To reach a culture obsessed with status, we must overpower shame. Now, I want to share with you from Matthew chapter 10 and then turn our attention very quickly to John chapter 9. So listen to me as I read from Matthew chapter 10. Uh, And I'm going to read verses 32 and 33. Here's what Scripture says. Jesus speaking, so, says this, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. To reach a culture obsessed with status, we must overpower shame. See, Jesus originally spoke these words to a culture that is driven, that was driven by honor and shame. A culture that based the value of a person, not upon whether they were necessarily right or wrong, or, or, or how they had 
done what they had done or how they had lived their lives in a way uh, that was obedient to God or not obedient to God. No, this was a culture that was was that based the value of people based on what other people said about them or what classification they were put in or what kind of slot they were put in, if you will. Jesus spoke these words to such a culture in which honor is social currency. So if you want to move up in the world or if you want to experience a life that uh, is a little more pleasurable or a little more um, enjoyable, then you need honor. Honor is the currency with which you would purchase such things. Without honor in such a culture, in the eyes of those around you, you have nothing. So your value is not based off, again, of what you've done. It's based off of how what you have done is viewed by those around you. Everything becomes about appearances. People are driven to make decisions based on how things look rather than how they actually are. That's why when Jesus comes and preaches to this culture, he so often talks about issues of the heart. Hey, you've got it all right on the outside, but all wrong on the inside. Why? Because in their culture, as long as you had it all together on the outside, it didn't matter what it was like on the inside. Everything was good because you could get somewhere in society. You had social currency to invest in your life as long as you had the honor of those around you, as long as you could make sure your appearance, your appearance gave you honor to those around you. Regardless of whether they were fundamentally right or wrong, appearance mattered much more. So they would ask questions like this. Will my actions, instead of saying, are my actions right or wrong, they would ask this. Will my actions bring social acceptance or social rejection? And what can I do to be accepted socially? How can I be considered part of the culture? Now, we are moving more and more every day. Literally, at light speed, we're moving into this culture of honor and shame, where right and wrong doesn't matter as much anymore to the culture around us and the society around us as much as honor and shame matter to, to the culture and the society around us. But, you know, we've all lived in this environment before. I just showed you a picture a few moments ago from high school. Uh, if you lived through high school, if you lived through middle school, then you lived through an honor and shame culture. A culture where one bad move, one mistake, wearing the wrong shirt on the wrong day could move you out of the right circle. You might not be able to sit at the same lunch table as somebody else anymore. You certainly couldn't date people who were in some other group that you really had no access to. You were on the outside looking in. You know, some of you will say, well, hey, pastor, I didn't buy into any of that. I was a rebel. I went against the in crowd. Well, here's what I want you to realize, that even in being a rebel, even in being a person that pushed back against all of that, you pushed back against the standards that were set by the in crowd. That's how you determined your rebellion. That's how powerful uh, a culture of honor and shame is, that even those who rebel against such a culture determine their rebellion based on what the in crowd determines is honorable or what the in crowd determines is not honorable. So we need to realize this truth. That we live now today in an everly increase in an ever increasingly culture of honor and shame. If nothing else tells us this, it should be the use of selfies and filters. So I know probably most of us have taken a selfie at some point. There's nothing sinful about selfies, but selfies definitely determine and tell us something about our culture. We live in a selfie culture. We're getting just the right image of yourself at just the right angle and even now applying just the right filter to make yourself look a particular way tells us that we're so consumed with what others think about us. And we all know those selfies don't really give an accurate portrait of reality. In fact, we all know the people in many of those pictures that we see look nothing like they do in the pictures. Sometimes we'll see a picture of somebody that we know and we'll say, wait a second, that's not them. That doesn't look like them at all. It's been so filtered and doctored and changed that it doesn't even look like the person. Why? Because we're shifting into a culture where what is real doesn't matter anymore, but what appears to be real is what matters because we are shifting into an honor and shame culture. This is from a conversation. I want to read you a, a message from a conversation I had just last night. It says this, you know, it's crazy how influential likes and shares have become. If something is liked or shared, then it's influential. If something is not liked or shared, then it's not influential. They can make or break people in every way. 
And, it's what, and what is presented is not reality. We build fake realities in order to be accepted by people we don't even really know. Then this morning, I saw from another local pastor, I saw a post talking about this very same issue. That pastor said this, Okay, it's time to be real on Facebook for just a second. Have you ever noticed that everyone on Facebook seems to have it all together? And you can insert whatever social media you use. Maybe you use Instagram. Maybe you use TikTok. Here's, it, it would apply in any across all uh, forms of social media. Everyone has a great marriage. Everyone has kids that are successful and talented. Honestly, I'm as guilty as anyone for posting only the happy, the joyous, the wonderful moments of our life for people to see. I'm guilty of only posting my kids being successful in sports or at school. I'm guilty of being a poser. I took a few minutes the other day and began to scan my Facebook post, and I realized something. The life that I live on Facebook is not real. For instance, I only post videos of my kids when they hit the ball, never when they strike out. I only post my happiness when my boys bring home good grades, but I never seem to post anything about their struggles with studying, homework, and projects. Personally, I never post anything about the struggles of being a husband, a father, or a pastor. That you, the Facebook world, never see the arguments that my wife and I sometimes get into. All anyone sees on Facebook is, as I see it, perfection. You know, we all are guilty of this. We live in that world. Why? Because we have a culture of honor and shame. Reality doesn't matter nearly as much uh, as appearance matters. So in an honor and shame culture where appearance matter, appearances matter more than reality, understand that many of the people we are trying to reach, many of the people that we love and care about, many of the people in our community and in, in the culture increasingly are driven by an honor and shame, driven by acceptance, driven by appearance. So we have a choice. We have a choice when we realize something like this, and it's hard to argue that we're moving into that kind of culture. In fact, we're already in that kind of culture. And so we have a choice. When we look at that, we can say, but that's not right. That's not right. We, we shouldn't judge people based off of appearances, and it's true. That's not right. Our culture's not moving in a right direction, and, and they shouldn't live in that kind of culture, and it's true. We should have a culture that's, that's based off of truth and reality, not based off of appearances. But we have a choice to make. We can kind of step back from the culture, and we can criticize the culture, but we have very little opportunity in that situation to actually reach the culture. Or our second option is this. We can take a long, hard look at how the gospel intersects an honor and shame culture so we can reach those who are enslaved to it. See, there's no perfect culture. Every culture is deeply impacted by sin. There are some cultures that are more honorable and biblical than others, but there's no perfect culture. And what we have to do is take the gospel and bring it to bear on every culture. And aren't we thankful that as we move into an honor and shame culture, aren't we thankful that the very document that we rely on, the, the document of Holy Scripture, was written to an honor and shame culture? That the stories that we read about, the encounters that Jesus had, that they took place in an honor and shame culture. That means that we are better equipped to address an honor and shame culture than we are any other culture. That means that the gospel is not outdated in 2020. It means that just as it always is, the gospel is more than adequate to address every issue that will be raised in 2020, 2030, 2040, and beyond. As long as Jesus delays his return, the gospel will be the only answer for every issue that mankind, that humanity encounters. So, will we, as followers of Christ, do the hard work, the difficult work of thinking through how the gospel intersects an honor and shame culture so we can be prepared to reach those that we care about and those that we love? So, we are compelled by the glory of God, by the great commission, by our love for others to take the gospel to all people, especially in 2020, those who are shaped by an honor and shame culture. And how do we do that? Well, we look to Scripture, and in just a moment, we're going to see John chapter 9. Jesus bring the gospel to someone who is so impacted and so shaped by an honor and shame culture. And we're going to see that lived out, and we're going to see some principles. But before we get to that, just to continue to lay the foundation, I know this is a long introduction, but it's important. We have to ask the question, 
What would keep someone from coming to confess Jesus as Savior and Lord in an honor and shame culture? See, in a guilt and innocence culture, what keeps someone from coming to profess faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord is that they love their sin, and they don't want to admit they're guilty. They want to pretend to be innocent, and they don't want to admit they're guilty. And so it's hard for them to come to a point to admit they're guilty because they actually love their sin. And if they admit they're guilty, if they admit what they've done is wrong, then they've got to give up their sin because now they need to be innocent even in the eyes of the culture. And so they come to Christ, but they have this battle before they come to Christ over whether or not they want to let go of their sin. They're afraid of letting go of their sin because they're afraid that on the other side of their sin, they're not going to enjoy life as much as they do in their sin. That's a guilt and honor, a guilt and innocence culture, and that's the culture we've lived in. And so for years, we've confronted people in their sin, and we've said to people, you need to understand that you're a sinner, and you need to understand that there's life on the other side of sin, and that God wants to forgive you. And we've approached a, a culture that understands that, that gets that. But now as the culture shifts, the gospel does not change. The need for repentance from sin doesn't change. The need for forgiveness doesn't change. But the way we communicate that, the way that we understand people hearing our message, has to change because they hear the message in a different way. In an honor and shame culture, the reason that someone would not come to confess Christ is because they're afraid of what it will cost them not in their own sin, and their own enjoyment of their own sin, but in their social status. What happens to a person when they come to know Christ in 2020 is very different than what happens to a person when they come to know Christ in 1986 as I did. See, I grew up in a time where even though people didn't necessarily follow the Jesus, Jesus the way that I did, and uh, they didn't necessarily, they weren't sold out to Christ, they applauded me for being sold out to Christ, and they encouraged me to do so. And when I would drift away from it, people, the overall culture would push me back to Jesus, and not only my church culture, but my school culture, my community culture, everyone everywhere was reinforcing the same message, that it's good to follow Jesus, it's a good thing to follow Jesus, and and, and you need to go in that direction. But the culture is very different now. For someone who comes to Christ in 2020, there's actually cultural shame that comes along with that. And their status is injured in that way. And they're afraid of the shame that comes along with it. They're ashamed of being put outside of the circle and being on the outside looking in. And shame is real. And we're not talking about the internal shame that we have because of our sin. We should have shame because of sin. When we sin against God, we should feel shame for our sin. And the cross covers that shame. So we're not talking about that kind of shame. We're talking about external shame. Shame that is not in here because we've committed sin, but shame that is out there because the culture no longer thinks we're in step in the way that we should be. That external shame, and it is very powerful. It is very powerful. Until recent times, shame is what caused many unregenerate lost people to actually obey the laws of God. So it was shameful in our society to commit sin. It was shameful in our society to live in a sinful way. It was shameful in our society, and that shame was so powerful that even people who did not follow Jesus would generally try to follow the laws of God and would generally try to live their life in a way that looked like they were pleasing God because of the overall power of the culture. But that has shifted. Now what is right is called wrong, and what is wrong is called right. And those who choose to follow Christ will not be applauded by the culture, but they will be shunned by the culture. And listen, we can't remove the social shame of following Jesus. That's how some people have tried to solve this problem. They've tried to say, well, let's just reinvent the gospel and let's reinvent Jesus so that there's really no social shame attached to Jesus. Let's remove all the things that would be shameful in 2020 about following Jesus and let's make some watered down version of following Jesus, some different version of following Jesus, a new version of following Jesus, but we can't do that. Doing so would be like removing the need to acknowledge sin. It's changing the gospel. And anytime we change the gospel, which means good news, we end up with what Paul calls no gospel at all. So we've taken the good news out of the gospel. So we can't do that. We can't take away the social and cultural shame that will come from following Jesus. So how do we deal with something that is so powerful? 
How do we reach those in their teens and their 20s and their 30s? And some of you know them. They're in your families and your heart breaks to reach them. And, and you know that everything around them, the culture around them is telling them that to follow Jesus is shameful. That to follow Jesus is not the way that they need to live their lives. And you don't know how to reach them. And you recognize and you realize the power of shame. So how do we deal with this? How do we do this? The way we do it is we overcome shame with something that's more powerful. See, shame is powerful, but it is not the most powerful force in the universe. In fact, in John chapter 9, what we see are four forces that will overpower shame. John chapter 9, Jesus heals a man who's been blind from birth. This man was born blind. He and his disciples are walking along, and they see in the early verses of John chapter 9, this man, the disciples ask a question. Why was this man born blind? Was it because he sinned or because his parents sinned? And Jesus says, neither. You completely misunderstand the relationship between sin and suffering. There's not always a direct relationship between sin and suffering. Sometimes you suffer, yes, because of your sin. But many times you suffer just because of the brokenness of the world and the sin of those around you. That's the case with this man. So it's, it's neither, Jesus says. But so that God's glory can be revealed. God wants to do something in this man. That's why he was born blind from birth so that we could have this encounter. And then Jesus heals him. Well, when Jesus heals him, word gets out. A man who was born blind, who is now an adult, has been healed. He's never seen anything. And Jesus opens his eyes, and now he can see everything. So word gets out, and the Pharisees get involved. And they're the arbiters of cultural honor and cultural shame. What they say is honorable is honorable. What they say is shameful is shameful. And they get involved, and they want to know because they don't like Jesus. And they want to know, hey, what happened here? And to top it off, it happens on the Sabbath. So they believe they have a way to hurt Jesus, to injure Jesus. So they want to know what happened to this man. And this man tells them what happened to him. And and they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear that, that Jesus had the power to heal this man who had been born from birth. So they say, well, get his parents in here. And his parents come in. And his parents say, yeah, this is our son. He was, he was born blind. Now, we don't know what happened to him. We have no idea how this happened. But yes, this is our son. He was born blind. Now he can see. And the Pharisees are in a difficult situation. They definitely don't want anybody involved, either the son or the parents, speaking anything good about Jesus so they ask the man, what do you think about Jesus? And they ask his parents, what do you think about Jesus? And to show you the power of an honor and shame culture, that question, that question divides parents from their children. Because the parents say, you ask him. You ask him. They were afraid to answer. John chapter 9 verse 22 says this, the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue, to be separated from community, to be cut off from all social and cultural life in that community, to be put out of the synagogue. This doesn't just mean that they can't come to church anymore. This means they're no longer a part of the in crowd. This means that prospects for marriage or relationships, prospects for friendships, prospects for business are all cut off. Everything that happens in the community life in first century Judaism flowed through the synagogue. So to be kicked out of the synagogue was to be cut off from every aspect of social and cultural life. So the Pharisees had already said, if anyone, if anyone confesses Jesus to be the Christ, you're out. We're going to shun you and shame you. You will lose your honor. So the parents said, we, we don't know anything about this. Why don't you ask him? Well, that's where we pick up the story in John 9, 33. So look with me, if you will, in John chapter 9, verse 33. The Pharisees are giving the man one last opportunity to deny Jesus. Here's his reply. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The blind man says, hey, I'm healed. That's proof that Jesus was sent from God. Verse 34, they answered him, you were born in utter sin. So they were caught in that bad theology that said that because he was born blind, he was clearly sinful from birth. So it says, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us. So they cast him out. This doesn't mean that they escorted him to the door and told him to leave. This means that they cut 
him off from every aspect of community life. They kicked him out of the synagogue. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. This man overcame the cultural shame of identifying with Jesus. How? How is it that this man, this man who was born blind, overcame the cultural shame of identifying with Jesus? How will we lead people to Jesus in an honor and shame culture? You know how we'll do it? We will use forces that are more powerful than shame. Four forces very quickly in this passage that I want us to see that are more powerful than shame. The first force that is more powerful than shame is the power of serving. The power of serving. How did this all start? This started with Jesus healing the man. I want to read from you John chapter 9 verses 5 through 7. I want to read the healing moment. Jesus says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Notice how this healing is connected directly to who Jesus is. Verse 6, having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Jesus' first encounter with the man was an act of healing, an act of service, an act of love. He was in need. He could not see. Jesus stepped into that moment and served him. You know well, if you have studied the New Testament, that many times... Jesus' opening act, if you will, is an act of service. Feeding the hungry, healing the sick, touching the leper, teaching those who are like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus came serving. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. That's how Jesus came. In an honor and shame culture, many times our first acts should be acts of service. You know, it's difficult sometimes to serve someone who disagrees with you. But the truth is, Jesus calls us through the power of his teaching, the power of the gospel, to even serve our enemies. Called to love and serve our enemies. We're called to go two miles when we're asked to go one. We're called to give up our cloak and our tunic when we are asked for our cloak only. You know, our serving must not make people feel like they're our personal evangelism project. See, that's, that's where I think we serve sometimes, where we just say, well, we're serving, and then we're going to kind of tack the gospel onto the end of it, and the only reason that we're serving you is in order for an opportunity to share the gospel. Now, that's not to say we should disconnect the gospel from serving. No, we shouldn't do that. See, Jesus didn't do that. He never does that. Every time he serves, he's always teaching the gospel of the kingdom. Why would Jesus heal someone but then not tell them about the eternal healing? And in this case, he, he opens with the gospel. He says, I'm the light of the world, and I'm going to show you that I'm the light of the world by opening your darkened eyes that have been dark since birth. So Jesus connects the gospel with his serving every time, the moment that we have no opportunity to share the gospel is the moment that we can no longer serve. So when we're told, well, you can serve, you can do, you can be a part of this, but you cannot bring Jesus into this, then that's the moment where as a church, as a family, as Christians, we back away and we say, you know, I, I would love to be a part of this, but, but I am defined by the gospel, and I cannot separate myself from the gospel. I cannot separate myself from Jesus, but there are so many ways and opportunities that we can serve. And by the way, that doesn't mean that every time we serve that Jesus always has to come out of our mouths. There are times that we realize we're given an opportunity to serve and that in that opportunity we're able to do something or build a bridge, if you will, to the gospel where we'll later be able to share the gospel. I had an opportunity to speak a few years ago in an organization, and it was, a, it was a very important speech for this organization, and I don't want to go into too much detail because the leader of that organization took a big risk in asking me to speak because it was clearly not a place to ask a preacher to come and preach a sermon. And so he was a friend of mine, and he asked me to come and preach. By the way, not a Christian. This man was not a Christian, but he knew I was, and he asked me to come and speak. And he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to come and I want you to, to teach on this particular subject. But listen, you can't talk about Jesus. If you agree to come, you can't talk about Jesus. And I said, you know what? I'll come and I'll do it. I'll do it as a way to serve you and to serve 
this organization. But now notice, I was not disconnecting the gospel from this opportunity to serve because I had so many other opportunities to have influence in this organization where I was able to share the gospel. This gave me a platform to, um, to capitalize on those other opportunities that I had to share the gospel. So that's what I did. I went and I shared. I shared a very biblical message without really mentioning the Bible, and I shared a gospel-centered message without even mentioning the gospel or Jesus. And that opened doors, and I saw people come to Christ in that moment. So that's not to say that we never serve on any occasion where we're not sharing the gospel and speaking the gospel every single moment. No, there are times where doors will open and wisdom will tell us that this is not the time to explicitly speak the gospel. But if we go into serving opportunities and we say, you know what, in order to serve, in order to serve, we're going to completely disconnect from the gospel. There's no bridge back to the gospel. There's no way for us to get to the gospel. Then we are abandoning the only power that can actually bring the hope and the healing that we're trying to bring in any situation. So we serve. We serve. And the power of serving is a key that can unlock doors that cannot be unlocked in any other way. And they open the opportunity for us to share the gospel. The second power that I want us to see is this, the power of community. You know, verse 35 tells us that when Jesus heard the man had been cast out, Jesus went to him. And what did Jesus go to him to do? Jesus went to that man to invite him into community. So he's been kicked out of community. Jesus doesn't go and say, hey, let's go back down to the synagogue and see if we can get you reinstalled at the synagogue. No, Jesus knows that he can't undo the shame that comes along with following him. He doesn't try to undo that shame. He doesn't try to deny the impact of that shame. He just simply says, there's a greater community. You've been kicked out of community, but there's a greater community. And I'm inviting you into the community of the Messiah, of the Christ, of the Savior. I'm inviting you into Jesus' community. And yes, you lost the community of the synagogue, but there is a greater community. And listen, followers of Christ, if we're going to reach people in an honor and shame culture, they have to see the power of gospel-centered community. They have to see that lived out. Because what we're asking them to do is we're asking them to leave their community. We're asking them, even though they won't necessarily step out, in many cases they'll be kicked out. The shame will be too great, and they will lose their community. And as they lose their community, they have to see the power and the beauty of gospel-centered community. And you know, there's nothing like real gospel-centered community, where people are living their lives together around the gospel, where everything they do is oriented around the gospel. Every problem they face is conquered by the gospel. Every step that they take as a group is determined by the living out the gospel. There's nothing like it. There's no more beautiful community on the earth. And so as people begin to come to Christ and they, they have questions about stepping out of the community that they're in and stepping into this community, what they need to see is the beauty of gospel-centered community. What does gospel-centered community functionally look like? It looks like this. It looks like groups of believers living out the gospel together. Yes, in churches, but more importantly, in families, amongst Smaller groups inside the churches, groups of men, groups of women. See, it's hard to live out gospel-centered community in a, in a large church. We can't really function as a community of a, of a thousand or fifteen hundred people, but we can as families function in gospel-centered community. We can as groups of men or as groups of women or groups, uh, couples groups or even groups of teenagers or even groups of children. We can build these gospel-centered communities and then invite those who have not yet surrendered to Jesus to come and experience that community. Now, there's a way in which they can't be a part of the community of God until they cross that bridge, until they cross that line to give their heart to Jesus. But that doesn't mean we can't expose them to gospel-centered community so that they see what it's like to be a part of the family of God before they sever the ties that would cut them off from their other community and their other family. This practically looks like having neighbors around your dinner table. Practically looks like inviting new friends into your existing circle of friends. It looks like serving together and inviting someone who doesn't know Christ to be a part of your serving. And here's the thing, as we do this, it can't be fake. In other words, your family needs to live out gospel-centered community. You need to, have, you need to uh, settle conflict in gospel-centered ways. Repentance, forgiveness. 
You need to bring Jesus into your conversations naturally. And the, the more that you fall in love with the gospel as a family, then the more natural it is to bring somebody to sit at your table and the gospel saturates every conversation. Because see, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying bring your neighbor over for dinner and say, well, neighbor, the reason we've invited you over here tonight is so that you can hear the gospel, open up your Bible, and walk through the Romans road. Now, might there come a time for that? Certainly. And I'm not against gospel presentations, but I'm not saying that. But here's what else I'm not saying. I'm also not saying, oh, well, just be real nice, and they'll understand the gospel. See, those are two extremes. On one extreme, we say, preach the gospel, use words when necessary. Well, that doesn't work, because the gospel is a message of words. And in order to preach the gospel, there are words involved. But on the other end of the spectrum, we say, hey, we've got, we've got to get the gospel presentation out as quickly as possible, and we've got to sum it up in 30 minutes, or 10 minutes, or 5 minutes, and then we need to say, are you ready to pray to receive Christ? And sometimes that's the case. Sometimes all we have is five minutes. We may never see the person again. But here's what I'm proposing. What I'm proposing is that you are so in love with the gospel, your life is so oriented around the gospel, that anybody who spends any time around you sees you living out, talking about, saturating your conversations with gospel themes, talking about what God's teaching you in Scripture, talking about how the Lord is walking with you through difficult times, and they see in that, and they hear in that, the themes of the gospel over and over, and you couple that with serious conversations at appropriate times to share the gospel with them. Talking about living this out in gospel-centered community. And this is not theoretical for me. This is how our family has tried to share the gospel now for uh, almost a decade. And we have seen long-term effective fruit come from this, the power of gospel-centered community. Speaking to someone who shares the gospel regularly with an honor and shame culture in another part of the world, they told me this one time. They said, you know, the people that I'm trying to reach, they won't come to Christ until they see that I love them more than their family loves them, because coming to Christ means losing the love of their family. That same is true for us in 2020. They won't come to Christ and bear the shame and the reproach of the community they're coming out of until they see that the community they're coming into replaces that love and even more power of community. Third, the power of patience. You know, the man in this story confesses Jesus as Lord. It's an amazing confession. But before that, he has a progression. If you were to look back in verse 11, he describes the person who healed him simply this way, the man called Jesus. Well, the man called Jesus did this. Who healed you? The man called Jesus, verse 11. By verse 17, he, he's saying this. Well, he must be a prophet. He, he's clearly a prophet. So we've Progress from the man called Jesus, just a clear indication of who the person actually is, all the way to he is a prophet. Verse 33, he says, well, he's a man from God, and there's no way I can't say he's a man from God. And by verse 38, the man is calling Jesus Lord. You know, it happened quickly for this man, and it does happen quickly for some people. But for others, it takes some time. So think about the disciples. Peter was the first to confess Jesus. He made his great confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's difficult to know for sure, but it seems that that took anywhere from one to two years before Peter put it all together, before he completely understood that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thomas was the last of Jesus' disciples to confess him. And that took... Three years, a death, a burial, a resurrection, hearing about the resurrection from his friends, but even that was not enough. He had to have a physical encounter with the risen Jesus before he would say, my Lord and my God. Sometimes it happens in a day. Sometimes it takes three years. The power of patience. We cannot expect people to come to Christ in one encounter after a few gospel conversations. That can happen, and it does happen, and it has even happened for some of you. But for many people, it's the progress through living in gospel-centered community, through a thousand conversations and a hundred sermons, that finally, finally, you come to see 
the truth of the gospel. That's why community is so important. That's why serving is so important. By serving and opening the door for people to come into community and then by providing a seat for them in the community and allowing them to hear the gospel 10, 20, 30, 40 times before it sinks in that they need Jesus. Power, patience. In an honor and shame culture that is also a theologically confused and illiterate culture, we must be patient. Finally, there's one last power, the power of Jesus. See, when Jesus steps in, everything changes. And, and really, really, this is the only real power that can overcome shame. All these other powers are great, the power of serving, the power of community, the power of patience, those are all great. But left to themselves, they do nothing to overcome a culture of shame. But when Jesus steps in, everything changes. See, that's when it changes for this man. Jesus steps in, he heals him, Jesus steps back, he's shamed, he's kicked out of his community, but then Jesus steps back in and everything changes for this man. Why do we serve? We serve so people can encounter the risen Savior? Why do we invite people into community so they can encounter the risen Jesus? Why do we wait patiently? Because we're praying that any day they're going to encounter the risen Jesus. And truth be told, we are absolutely powerless to win anybody to Christ. We cannot reach into their heart. We can't bring them to a point of conviction. We can't bring them even to see their own sin. And we can't bring them to see the value of Jesus over and against the culture that would shame them. But Jesus can. In a moment, in an instant, over a year, over a decade, God can do his work through Jesus. So it is the power of Jesus. That's why when we begin this process, we always begin with prayer. We start there, acknowledging, God, if you don't reach them, they'll never be reached. God, if you don't show them, they'll never see. If we will reach those in an honor and shame culture, it must begin with serious fervent prayer for those who don't know Christ, calling out individuals by name and asking God to help them see the truth of the gospel and the beauty of the gospel that overcomes the power of the shame of the culture around them. And secondly, we'll ask, how can I serve them? What can I do to serve them? Thirdly, how can I bring them into gospel-centered community? And then finally, we just have to be patient and allow God to do his work. Evangelism and an honor and shame culture. It's not easy, but evangelism is never easy. We weren't called to evangelism because it was easy. We're called to evangelism because it's necessary. We're called to make disciples because disciples must be made. God's glory must be exalted in the nations. And people from every corner of Mobile and every corner of the planet need to hear about Jesus. So we're not called because it's easy. We're called because it must be be done. You know, I want to encourage you today. We have something of a, an electronic altar call, if you will. In whether you're watching us on uh, the Facebook feed or you're watching us through YouTube, down in the comments, there's a Zoom link. And listen, I, I know that, that it's a little weird. It's, it's a little strange to click on a link. But if you'll click on that link, it's going to take you into a, a room where you're going to speak one-on-one -on -one with a prayer counselor. And look, right now, the Holy Spirit is moving in some of your hearts. And it may be that the Holy Spirit is moving in your hearts, and you want to give your life to Jesus, but you're not sure how. This hasn't really been an evangelistic sermon, so maybe you don't understand what it means to follow Jesus, but you know you're, you're ready to leave that, that, that honor and shame culture. You're ready to just say, I want to do what's right, not what brings me honor. I, I want to quit living a fake life. I don't really care what people think about me. I just want to be right with God. Maybe the Holy Spirit of God has moved on you in that way. Listen, there are people who are ready and willing to speak to you one-on-one, -on -one, individually. You'll be placed with an individual counselor. But there are others of you who know you need to pray for someone. You need to pray for someone who, it may be a young person, who is surrounded by a culture that points them away from the gospel, that is a part of a lifestyle that points them away from a gospel. And you just need the day to begin praying for that person, praying that God would give them the strength to step out of that culture that will shame them when they do, but to step into the community of Jesus and follow him. If the Holy Spirit of God is moving on your heart right now, you need to click that link. Get in that prayer chat room and speak to face-to-face -to -face with one of our prayer counselors. They are waiting. They are ready to pray with you. They are ready to pray for you. And they're ready to pray for those who need Christ. The first step is to pray right now. You can take that step. If we were in this room together, 
I would challenge you, get up out of your seats, come to this altar, kneel in this altar, and cry out to God on behalf of those you want to see come to know Christ. I'm asking you to do the same thing right now, but instead of getting out of your seat and coming forward, I'm asking you to click on that link, speak to one of our prayer counselors, and pray with them for those you know need to come to Christ. Right now, I want to lead us in prayer, and I want to ask that you would be obedient to what God has asked you to do, what the Holy Spirit of God has put on your heart. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, would you move in the hearts of those who are listening, move in the hearts of those who hear. Father, would you help us God, just to begin with prayer. And Lord, would you show us ways to serve? God, would you show us ways to open up gospel-centered community and bring them into it? And Lord, would you give us patience? Lord, we trust and believe that you are at work in this world. And Lord, that whether it's a guilt and innocence culture or an honor and shame culture or some other culture that we've never even imagined, God, you and the power of the gospel are powerful enough to overcome every barrier and bring everyone that calls on your name into a relationship with you. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name.